Holly Randall Unfiltered is brought to you by our friends at Manscaped. Their Lawnmower 3.0 is a revolutionary electric trimmer that won't nick or snag your nuts. So go to manscaped.com, use code HRU for 20% off plus free shipping. Hello, everybody. I am Holly Randall, and welcome back to my show, Holly Randall Unfiltered. I have a very special, wonderful guest for us today. I have Rebecca Moore, otherwise known as Moore Milf. She is a British adult star, also known as a gay icon as well, and we're so thrilled to have her here today. Rebecca, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. It's a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Um, I absolutely love your podcast. It's brilliant. I was just watching one as I was preparing for this and um, I actually tweeted it because it was Savannah, um, the the lady who had, that was, that was an amazing one. Yeah, I really enjoyed that. So I was just prepping because I hadn't, haven't done a podcast for God knows how long. But I mean, you're no stranger to media. You've had um, like so much exposure in, in mainstream media and you're, you know, quite the big social media star. So I can't imagine that this is uh, your first interview. No, no, definitely not. I, um, I, I've been very lucky in that department. Um, I've had ever since that video that I made with Sophie um, I had had quite a few bits previous to that. Um, they were of a different nature. Um, I did a, a, a gangbang here in the UK, which there was complete, like I did it in a lorry because there was a law that if the shutters were down, I couldn't get arrested. So I did a Rebecca Moore sex tour in the UK. And that was probably um, the first time that I got some press. And I just accepted that was never going to get positive press it's always going to be negative because of and I just it rolled with it I was kind of like I kind of like this um but before that also I had played Margaret Thatcher in a, a porn porn film and so I had the wig and things like that and so a couple of magazines picked that up and I would do all these not particularly hot women parodies for porn um, but that was one of my favourites, I think. And then um, it was actually done before she passed. So when she died, we had to take it down off the internet just out of respect for a bit. But it's back up. Mm. <laughs> so Okay. Well, you know, I mean, part of being a public figure is having parodies made of you. And, you know, I think in some ways it's it's very complimentary. Exactly. So tell us, um, let's start from the beginning. Uh, how did you get started in the adult industry? So um, I've always been quite open about um, the, my first step into like the sex industry was working as an escort. And for me, I was, I went straight into that. I felt I was like a natural porn star anyway. I, I gave it my all. And um, it wasn't until I was in in that job for like a year or so and doing really well and porn other porn stars um were getting booked with me and I realized very quickly that they were getting paid more than me um but doing less and I was thinking okay this is not cool but I didn't want to do porn at that stage I was just too busy enjoying myself doing escorting um and having the time of my life doing that and so I turned down doing porn for uh, like we don't didn't have big productions here. There was like Television X and things like that. It wasn't quite like America. America's a whole different scale. And um, so people would offer me and I was like, okay, how much can you get paid? And, and they would tell me, I was like, no. Um, but anyway, I soon realized that porn could be a really good marketing tool for me to um, market my great escort um, job that I was doing. So I decided with a girl called Paige Turner, we were, I remember the day we went, should we be porn stars? And um, we were like, yeah, let's be porn stars. And um, so we both did our first porn film together and that was for um, Tanya Hyde, 
who does fetish stuff and I'm I've been very influenced by um their work it's really is so I I just love it I still it's still iconic to me to this day um so that was great and I remember my first scene like anything um she she did re- she she did really well her career accelerated it took me a little while to get my like break um but eventually it happened for me and um yeah that was it the rest is history <laughs> so um i you're very open about the fact that you you know used to escort or i don't know maybe if you still do um, and I know that there, you know, I've spoken to quite a few performers who have done that or, you know, people who escort exclusively. Um, so tell us a little bit more about what that's like for you. Cause I know there's a lot of public misconceptions around that job. I love it. And I am a big firm believer about the law of attraction and you kind of like get back what you put out. Um, I have can there is i feel that there is a misconception of um that you have to keep to yourself and you kind of do you like i don't when i was doing it just doing that and obviously i'm a parent i was a parent to young children i didn't tell everyone i was i there was this kind of thing like i went to law school and i worked at the citizens advice bureau and i kind of like had this little side job, which was really exciting then. And I'll never get that back now because I'm a porn star. The fact that when, you know, that no one knows you and you're a secret, like you're a secret hooker. And I will never have that moment back because people know who I am. And I was, that's, that's an amazing thing to do is to do a normal job. You've got this little secret. Um, But yeah, I've had nothing. It changed my life. Um, I was a single, single parent and I just, I, I, you know, I just liked sex as well. So it, I was kind of, I was always, you know, when I was studying, I'd have free time and I'd go and see a guy, but you know, I've always been mum and dad to my kids. So I had to manage my needs and wants around like fitting that in when they were like at school or something. And it just worked perfect because you can have a career in escorting during the day. You can do a nine to five and make great money and spend more time with your kids. So it was a no brainer for me. And I'd been married, I'd had kids. I was like, I don't give a fuck what this does to a relationship. I don't need a boyfriend. I can have like 20 a week if I want and I'll get paid for it. So it was just perfect marriage for me. And I I was done caring what people thought. I've got kids, no one's paying my bills. I'm gonna pay them myself. I'm gonna have this great life. And I did. I. I had never gone out, I've never, I had never traveled outside of Europe. All of a sudden I'm being flown all over the place, getting paid well, living a life like I'm on a yacht in Miami, you know, I'm just having the time of my life. And I had gone from a broke single parent to this amazing life. And so I have nothing but good stuff to say about that world, but it's not for the faint hearted, there is a dark side if you haven't got your head screwed on properly. So I would never glamorize it to be something that, that it's not, there are ugly sides to it and you know, nothing's perfect. So. Yeah. So did you have any experiences when you were escorting that, um, were maybe a little bit dangerous, maybe a little bit scary and how did you navigate that? So I've, I had got out of two pretty scary relationships. So I was pretty well equipped with sensing danger, how to be set, sensible. I, I did cold calls for, for years as an escort. So I like, you know, you get the worst thing to happen is you get time wasted. So you're not making money. I, you had, I had, it was quite good because you had a platform called adult work, which I use. So you could see if they've got feedback and girls look after girls, you know, you'd have code words of whether they're good or not. And you'd leave bad feedback if they weren't great. So it was, it was a very simple system to keep yourself safe. Um, as your name got bigger, you don't ever do the phone calls. So when I wasn't a name, I would always answer my phone and like you learn to like double book just in case, you know, and it was a real hustle. So really I loved 
the growing part of it is amazing. It teaches you so much. It teaches you how to manage your diary, how to manage your finances, how to, you know, how to run your life and to do all this stuff. So I learned so much from the ground up in the sense of being a, a decent escort. And um, I I did not have any dangerous situations. I mean, the, the da- most dangerous situation I got in is from causing myself you know when you party too hard or or you know like just some of the crazy things that we've done at these things but they're all you know I'm here today I'm still alive and um they're all part of the story aren't they so yeah nothing yeah um I didn't have any any scary things happen and I think most of my clients would probably have been more scared of me than me of them <laughs> I, I did. I was very lucky with my clients. <laughs> yeah. You mentioned adult work, which you said was a website where other escorts could go on and kind of yeah. talk about uh, various clients, warn other girls. We had something very similar here called Backpage, which was shut down by the sesta Foster bill, which has been really damaging to the adult industry. Um, wow. So I, we've talked about the sesta Foster bill many, many times on this podcast. Um, if you guys want to go back and kind of check out some of my earlier episodes and learn more about it. You can see how pages, websites like Backpage were very beneficial for escorts. Uh, Just like you said, adult work was for you where they could really kind of look after each other Um, because it is very much a community. Uh, what, what were most of your clients like, like, did they all fit into one kind of specific type or were they all different types? Did you have favorites? Um, tell us a little bit more about the, the people that you worked for, worked with. So, um, I remember almost each and every one of them and there are thousands. Um, and I, you know, I think people in their head, they're like, oh, they must just all be desperate men, you know, not very attractive, blah, blah, blah. You couldn't be far from the truth. Like it was such a variety. Um, married is obviously very common um but yeah i i found that i was being i was having time i was spending time with men and women um and couples uh, that i might not have been attracted to in the outside world but in that moment in time that i'm spending with them i'm finding out i'm having a great time and yes i did develop favorites um i still have favorites um and I've, I, I have, I have some clients I've just had for years. I, I, I mean, I've been doing it for over 15 years and I, I really feel very confident in that field as well, that like I do a great service, you know, everything it's from everything, the way you, you know, the way you present yourself, the, what you bring to the, what you bring. And if you're doing an in-call that it's a beautiful experience, but also everything that they have like you're fulfilling their complete fantasy, like whatever they want, you are going to do that in that moment in time. And I value some people, you know, I'm not cheap. My, my rate has gone up and up and up and up over the years. And each time, like you need to fulfill that. You're like, my value is like, they're like, pay it, you know, and I want to make sure that I never, ever take that for granted. I want that experience to be exactly how they either see me on the screen or whatever they want. And that's kind of been something that I'm good at, you know, and I, I know I'm good at because I love it. So yeah, I, they've all been great from, you know, I don't see young guys anymore because I just can't do that. Like, I remember, you know, like, I remember like an 18 year old and it was just like, I just don't think I can do, yeah, it's like I, even 29 is kind of really young to me. Um, I much prefer older guys, much prefer older guys. It was just like, yeah. I mean, I work with Geordie, Geordie um, from Brazzers. And oh, yeah. it, you, you know, like I love Geordie because when you're actually in person, um you know, he he's just not remotely young at all, but that's like, we are selling a fantasy and, and that's it. But 
I'm happy to do that, but I'm very honest about it. I'm not into that at all. Like I really like old guys, you know, or guys mm-hmm. my age. So that was something that I was just like, and I get a lot of young guys emailing me because of those films I've done. And I'm like, mm-hmm. the last thing I want, I, they remind me of little puppies. Ex- Sorry guys, you know, but I'm going to be honest here. <laughs> like little excited puppies, like, uh, 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 like, no, don't, don't do that. Like, it's like too much. Sorry, I'm not doing this. So I just, that's like my, on my no list as a, as an escort, I want to have a, I want to have a good experience too. And it's for me as well. Um, so I just don't, I just don't like younger guys. Well, you know, some are okay. I have some on my only fans, which I'm like, yeah, you'll pass. I'm very like, <laughs> I'm very fussy now. <laughs> in my older well, age. I mean, you, you know, you've worked yourself into a position where you can be fussy and I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I'm definitely the same way. I'm way pickier about jobs and clients than I used to be. So I, I get that, you know, I've had, uh, I've had, um, people on, you know, full service sex workers as, as we also call them who have talked about, uh, escorting kind of like a performance art, which sounds like what you're describing is there any like particular thing that you find most of your clients are looking for? Any particular fantasy that they want to fulfill? So when I was younger, I feel that what I was putting out there to the world was a very extreme, hardcore, like submissive um, kind of role. And I really enjoyed that. I was very into partying, which kind of went with the territory. And I would, I was fucking outrageous. And I love it. I, I just love my memories. And then there came a time, and I think it was an age thing where I was like, I don't want that anymore. I'm now, I want to be, and I, because I'm a switch, I've always been a switch, but I, and I still do the sub role, but it's quite obvious from the content that I'm producing now that I'm naturally a woman in charge and I just can't help myself. It's just the way it is. I get a lot of role play, stepmom role play. I get domination stuff, just like a woman in control. They like that. They love, I love dressing up. I fucking love it. I think that's where most of my money has gone. I'm not into designer labels. I, I love designer shoes, but I'm very... I'm very good with my money. Um, I prefer my clients to buy everything, but I, I have an amazing collection of latex and, you know, so it's like when they, when they've booked me, I'm like, what would you like? Do, what do you want? What would you like me to wear? How many outfits? Like, cause this is my thing as well. Like I've got latex. I'm like, what would you like? What are we going to do? You know? And, um, that's most of my clients now is they really, are into the role play thing they like the dressing up they like the experience and stuff um but, but these days I mean I, I've, I don't do anal anymore that I I went I went in hard so hard that I just can't do anyone anymore if you know what I mean um mm. and uh, yeah it's just um just yeah mainly like role play kind of thing and and I lots of dinner dates I get treated like a queen to be honest it's not nice. yeah I've heard that a lot of times, especially I think when you get to the level that you're at and you have a lot of repeat clients and, you know, you're charging more money that a lot of times these men, um, yeah, obviously the sex is a part of it, but also just the company and somebody to spend an evening with is also a big part of it. And that conversation plays a large role. You're absolutely right. I can talk. (laughs) Britain that's got me through a lot of my bookings and it's very difficult when I find I they're actually on my no list if they don't talk I can't do silence I'm like I don't care we can't do this (laughs) so you talked um about you know uh being kind of outrageous um and that's definitely you know your social media presence is very like outrageous, outspoken. I mean, you're hilarious. You're so much fun to follow. Um, in fact, I mean, you're known as, you know, as the cock destroyer. So what, how much of that is like who you really are? Is that very much, um, a character that you play? Uh, how are you in real life? Is it like a little bit of both? And, and also like, what does a cock destroyer, what does that mean exactly? So I, so previous to meeting Sophie, which we formed the Cock Destroyers, um, so before before that, I I do feel that when you are in front of the camera, there's an element of you naturally ramp it up. 
Um, there is a lot of there is a lot of me in in that like in my private life personal life I'm pretty outgoing anyway but I do feel if I was to be honest I think everybody who's in front of the camera or is on social media or is on um uh you know does porn um there is an element of like performance to to things um particularly in my younger days is what I say because now I'm kind of going down the route where I want it to be more like authentic like so with my escorts films I want things to be real like less makeup and you know that kind of thing so so that's changing but yeah you know there is I did do characters because the whole role play and things like that and I loved I just would naturally there was you know I would naturally go into these like zones of like just being this stuck up bitch and I just really like because you you have to with escorting as well you have to channel certain you know if if you're like you're fearful you have to channel this kind of I'm going to do this I'm going to be this person or I'm going to I'm going to be a dominatrix or you know all these kind of personas that you put on and whatever your mood is that day and whether you're having a shit day you need to go to work and so you have to put on this persona so I was used to like putting personas on and then you know I went through this like I was like, right, I'm a MILF, I'm gonna embrace this, I'm gonna wear fucking loads of jewellery and wear these ridiculous heels that I can't walk in. And I just really I really immerse myself in like the dressing art part. And um I would do all these silly little videos with um a, um a guy that I was shooting with. And um what happened was I made that video with Sophie and I, Sophie, her and I, we we've broken up now um the cock destroyers no more but when we were together in the start we had this incredible dynamic energy which I remember making that video like it was yesterday and we just had we were because she was outrageous like she's still fucking outrageous I was outrageous and it was like meeting my match at that time um and I made this video and I just remember it coming out because we were like making videos because we had to promote a gangbang. And I was just like, do you know what we are? We're fucking cop stories. And I remember making this video like, I'm going to fucking, because it's like, I have, I just wasn't hiding the fact that, you know, we we will ruin men. Like we'd have these gangbangs and we'd just, we'd just like terrorize them in the sense like we were just so excited. Like we just, so we would scare some men obviously, but that and they just wouldn't book us but with Sophie it was like you had like we weren't scared we just there was like two of us like one of us was enough but like we just had this electric energy of like ah like it was like we've been pumped with testosterone or something and um mm -hmm. it was a magical moment that we made the video and I remember sending the video because I had a boyfriend at the time I went what do you think of this video have I gone a bit too far do you think I'll end up like not having anyone turn up at the gangbang with this and I showed him it and he went, nah, it's just you being you. And he went, post it. And the funny thing is, is had he gone, that's fucking, out, been a bloke that's like, that's fucking terrible, Rebecca. You know, it's so outrageous. Anyway, we didn't think it was going to go viral or anything. We posted it and we just kept getting these. It was about a week later or something like that. And I was like, I've made so many videos. What are you talking about? And to have a gay guy contact you and say you're a gay icon and then have another one and then have another one and then have another one and then another one you're go like this is you're like hold on you know Kylie knows gay icon like you know it's a really nice thing to be called and it just was so nice and um Sophie I contacted Sophie I said is it, what's going on and we couldn't work out what video it was and we didn't get it then we started to rewatch the video and then it was just like this snowball of newspapers and it just went crazy. It was amazing. Why do you think that um, the video appealed to the gay community so much? And what was the feedback specifically that you were getting from people? We were getting a lot of people like a meme so I didn't understand what a meme was and they were like this is us this is us this is me and, you know like this is us on a and they were like people were like oh my god there's two of them and like we were reading the comments it was just so funny like we didn't we didn't understand what viral meant or we didn't set out for it to go crazy like that and we just we were quite like overwhelmed like we just didn't understand um but we feel that they got got it it was like a, we didn't the video wasn't meant to be a joke it was meant to be like it 
but now I see the funny side because mm-hmm. I guess there is an element of comedy. Like I can't help but have a laugh when I'm making films. Like that's just my personality. But I, mm. I think, you know, it was just, it was a little bit in your face, the way we shot it and things like that. And I, somebody just said, you know, we, it's just great to see two women just giving it <laughs> like, this is us. And the thing was, is Sophie comes from the same space as what I do in the sense that we, we've had our kids. We don't give a fuck anymore. We're both single mothers and we're going to do what we want to do. And we don't give a shit about what anybody thinks about we've had it. We've had all the fucking judgment. We've had people going, oh, no, 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 no. And it's just like, okay, bore off. We've got the internet. We're going to make some money. We're going to fill out. We're going to sell out our gangbang. This is how we do it. This is our marketing tool. And this, this is the video we've produced. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's... um. It's great because, you know, so often when you say the word gangbang, so many people automatically think of like a poor, innocent young girl being victimized by all these aggressive men. And and I've spoken so many times about how gangbangs can be so different. Um, I've shot a couple of gangbangs and they've actually, the only time I've ever shot gangbangs is when I was hired by the performer who put the gangbang together, the female performer to shoot it. So I shot one for Joanna Angel, Riley Reed, and Lisa Ann. And all three of those women are very much empowered by sex and by what they, what they do. And it was really fun to shoot those because it was very much like a party that they put on. And so I think that, that yes, um, you guys are very funny, um, and you know, outrageous and, and all of those things. But I think there's like that very unexpected element of like a woman being empowered by a gangbang as opposed to being victimized, which is what I think most people think of when they think of the word gangbang. So there was probably that element as well that really like helped make it become such a big viral video. Yeah. Yeah. Cause they, they do, don't they? Like, um, but do, do you know what the funny thing is, is even in those videos where there's like, I, I know where that, that space is. There's girls that those girls that, um, that people think are being violated. They, the, the chances are they absolutely are having the time of their life, but not only that, let's just <clears throat> have respect for that girl because she's a fucking athlete at the end of the day. Any, like that's an athlete that's an athlete having her whole stretch. Like I'm, I'm there going, honestly, fucking, I'm, you know, this is, this is a sport, you know, this is a sport. And I watch some scenes of girls and people are going, oh, victim. I'm thinking, I'm thinking, no, this is, I, you know, I, I, I know what's going, you know, it's, it's, it's incredible what some of these women do. And, you know, they're like, oh, I'm having that. and that's all part of the, the the film you know they're like i need to look like mm-hmm. i'm being victimized because this is gonna sell fucking loads of films you know so yeah. i you know each each woman and and like yeah there's probably women in the past that have been you know had a bad experience of course there are but i, I like i sometimes think i can sort of watch i'm like oh she's good she's good she's putting on that fucking act you know like to you -hmm. know really like and they're athletes you know having all these guys and stuff like that I'm I'm always so impressed by some of the films that I watch it's yeah I think I'm a bit I think it's these days to be honest (laughs) I can't do that oh my god it's amazing Well, I think especially, you know, being a performer, you understand what goes into it and you understand how much work it is. And, and yes, honestly, like sexual athletes is a great way to describe most performers. It's a lot more work than people think it is. Um, I mean, you know, the women and and the men too, you know, I mean, it's a lot of work on both sides and I'm sure you get this all the time, but you know, I get tons of DMS of guys like, oh, I want to be in the porn industry. I think I could do it. I want to fuck loads of women. Like, and I'm just, you know, I masturbate a lot in my own room. Like I can do this. And I'm just like, man, you have no idea what this job really entails. And it is not, you know, just a case of just like laying on your back, you know, um, as a woman or as a man, just, you know, being able to like, you know, fuck a hot girl, um, you know, for 
15 minutes or however long you think uh, porn videos actually take to film, which is significantly longer than what you see in the final edit. I think that um, talking about guy performers, um, that's why, like, if you're a good guy performer, if you've got charisma, you can perform well, you've got a good cum shot, you're you're going to fly. And, you know, mm-hmm. I, I, I really have a lot of respect for my um, co- co-stars. Like, I've learned so much from when I started. I just used to want to fuck, you know, like behind the mm-hmm. camera, everything. I was just horny as fuck. And then as you go on and on in the career, you learn to save it for the camera. And I, you know, I feel like I tormented some of my co-stars because I'd be like, yeah, like I'd get them all juiced stuff and f- behind the camera and like they're worn out by the time we were in front of the camera and um you know that was you live and learn don't you because you're a bit younger and everything you're just excited but eventually you're just like right now don't touch me at this moment when we're in front of the camera save everything for then you know kind of thing um but it's it's not easy as male performers as well like I reckon that's really hard I don't have a dick but I can imagine sometimes if you know how to control that thing that's that's amazing but I, I i get the feeling that some guys can't control it as well as others <laughs> yeah yeah no it's uh i you know i i hosted a tv show for playboy tv uh years back for a couple of seasons yeah. and the whole premise was amateur couples filming their like a professional sex scene for the first time so you had to have zero experience in the porn industry in order to be on this show. And so all I did was shoot guys who'd never performed in front of the camera before with their significant other, which, you know, may or may not make it more difficult because they're not new and exciting to you. And on top of that, because of the condom laws out here and because it was Playboy and it was a big production, it was permitted they had to wear condoms. So these are guys that have been, you know, some of these were husband and wife couples that have been together for like 16 years, have kids, haven't worn condoms in all that time. And now they have to wear condoms and perform on camera. And the amount of men who came in with this like uber confidence because, you know, they went to swingers parties and had sex in front of other people, you know, when, you know, everybody was, it was a big like party and there's music playing and they're drinking and stuff. And when they have to come and shoot in front of, a crew and it's dead silent because you can't play music in the background. Right. Um, and you've got a boom hanging over your head and you've got lights on you and everyone's like staring at you, you know, waiting for you to get hard. And then you got to come at the perfect time. It was like, I mean, I feel like I crushed the dreams of so many men doing that show because it was just like so many guys failed. It was actually like kind of horrible, because it was just like every, it's like every day if you worked with a male performer who like couldn't perform, it was like that for like three seasons. And by the end of it, I was like, I can't, I can't do this. This is terrible. There were a couple of guys who were able to do it and actually was super impressive, but you know, like 90% of them um, really struggled. And it was, you know, and that, I mean, I've always respected the male performers um, and what they can do, but that experience made me like go, wow, like really much respect to you because this is such a difficult job it is do you know what the whole that whole what would have been a better thing of that is like just filming the documentary of the whole experience like that sounds like really good tv like this is this is for anyone who's honestly about going into porn. <laughs> yeah yeah that's what we kept saying we're like the behind the scenes of what's actually happening is the best is the show, but it was Playboy. So they're like, no, we have to sugarcoat everything and everything has to appear fun and sexy. And like, you know, we can't like show any reality. So I was like, okay, whatever, you know, but, um, yeah, that was, that was, that was funny. So, uh, we're going to take a quick commercial break guys. When we're going to come back, we're going to talk about what it's like to be a sex worker and a mother and so much more. So hang tight. I'll see you in just a bit. Got Bush. You definitely do if you haven't started using the products from my sponsor, Manscaped. 
Since I've started working with Manscaped, they've really expanded on their product line. It's incredible. So of course we've got the Lawnmower 3.0, their revolutionary electric body trimmer, which is not only cordless, but it's also waterproof. So you can actually use it in the shower. They also have the Crop Preserver and the Crop Reviver, a ball deodorant and a ball toner to keep your balls smelling nice and fresh. And if you get their perfect package, you will not only get the aforementioned ball toner and ball deodorant, but you will also get, of course, the electric trimmer, a shed travel bag, and their boxer briefs, which are the most comfortable boxer briefs you will ever wear. You can get all of this for 20% off at manscaped.com by using my code HRU. That's 20% off at manscaped.com by using my code HRU. All right, guys, we are back. So Rebecca, um, you've been very open about being a sex worker and a mother. Um, as a mother myself and a daughter who was raised by um, a woman who's considered one of like the pioneers for women in the adult industry and someone very influential, um, this is a topic that I really like love to explore. I think it's really important. And so my question to you is, how has fulfilling both those roles been for you and what have been some of the challenges that you've come across? So, um, I, they were pretty young when I started and when your kids are young and you are trying to keep a roof over their heads, pay bills, etc., you don't really think about the future. I was a young, young mum. I was 16, 17 when I had my eldest and he was a boy and, uh, about 24 when I had my daughter who I'm really close to. Um, so the, I think the truth is it's a little bit difficult having a, a a teenage boy. From my experience, it wasn't easy um, for obvious reasons. Um, if you're an active, it's great now that they're older, etc. But when you are in a career that is not only, um, you know, keeping your direct family supporting direct family family there's other members of the family that you start looking after whether that's your grandparents etc you've also got um you're you're putting your kids through private school and things like that it's really hard to compromise your security um for the sake of the internet now what happened was i feel it's probably even going to be even harder because today youngsters young teenage boys and girls but I I feel I didn't have such a bad experience with my daughter because she wasn't looking for porn or anything like that um but I do feel that I because I never told my kids I never we just wait like I I never went to their school I never did nothing but someone found someone recognized me and I, I there's a possibility I didn't get on with my son's dad there's a possibility that he may have said something or something like that but that's something I have to live with. Do you know what I mean? Like, you know, it's not ideal for your son. Sometimes it works out, sometimes it doesn't. But from my experience, I feel that, you know, it just wasn't ideal for my my son. I mean, he's, you know, in his 20s now. But, um, you know, it was a lot easier having a daughter who I'm, you know, I'm, so close to her but it was just it was difficult anyway with my my son I, you know his dad was a, a bit of a dickhead and there wasn't that support there so I feel that that's possibly how that went but there are ways it's not that was my experience you do have to protect them because like when they're young they you, I, I didn't want my kids to know that one like that's something that you have to keep from them you have to protect them you know the adult world is the adult world and you save that for the adult world, you know, like kids don't need to know that they don't need to experience that at school. So I had a cover story. I went to, you know, I was, I was going to, I was studying law. So that was great at that time. And so I had to juggle these lies. I never went to school. I never went to school to go and pick them up and stuff. I'd always pay someone to um, be at home. So there was a lot of I always had to have two places to keep all my work stuff and things like that. So raising kids as a single parent, as a sex worker, 
it's not easy. It wasn't easy in my experience, but I almost had to fight harder and make more money because of that. Like, in order to have this other place where I can go and do my work and stuff, because you have to keep them separate. So, you know, and, and to be honest, you become, you get a thick skin to people, the outside world judging you. You're like, do you know what? I've got enough going on here. I don't actually give a fuck what you think. I'm going to handle this myself. I want to protect my kids more than anyone, you know? And so you just, you just, you, you just, you know, I, I, I have great, I had a great support network. Like, um, and money helped that, you know, my kids went to private school and, you know, they had, um, they had great, um, people with it who would look after them in the week. And then at the weekend, um, I would, I, I was kind of like, I'd say like an absent father, do you know what I mean? That would go away for work and then spend time with them at the weekend. So that's kind of what it was like. I've got really close to my daughter in the pandemic. Like, you know, we always had the good times and stuff like that, but we've really bonded in the pandemic and um, she's just amazing. You know, she's just, I really am close to her, but unfortunately I'm not very close to my son and shit happens, like that's life. And, you know, nothing's perfect. I'm never going to sell someone a perfect story. And, you know, that is life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I Do you think that perhaps it was harder for your son uh, you said because he's a boy, like, did he, did he find like your videos and then, or you think someone just told him? I think someone told him, I think he was teased at school. Um, yeah, that's, I, that's the hard part. But as he got older, I remember him going, he loved meeting all my friends. <laughs> like when he was like 17, 18, he was like, yeah. I love this side of this world. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, but there was, but I think, there was resentment from him in the sense that, you know, and you know what, like when this video gets posted, there will be lots of hate. There'll be lots of, you know, if I, when I talk about my son and you know what, I know, I know, I, I know the, the comments that people get and how, Oh, you're a child mom. Like I've heard it a thousand times and people that's, that is life. You know, I'm, I just don't lie about these things. It wasn't, it wasn't an easy road. And, that is it. Shit happens, you know, and you just have to get through life and that's it. But you said you're, you're close with your daughter. So is she come to accept what you do for a living? Do you guys talk about it ever? Um, so, um, my daughter, we don't really talk about it because she, when she was younger, we, we talk about actually, yes, we do. We talk about, um, like, she said, you know, mums used to always ask her what I did for a living. And I was just like, um, because she'd be like, oh, they keep, they would never ask me. They'd always ask her. And I'd say, um, mummy's a model. And I was just like, that's very simple. It's not too much lying. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to lie all the time. And um, she said, mm -hmm. she said that it was always, she just didn't really know because I never told her I wanted to, but it is hard because she, what do you tell your young kids? Like for me, it's not something yeah. that you tell, like you don't like it's, it's an adult industry. And when they're like so young, you're not going to have that conversation, but until she was older and, um, we, you know, she, it was uh, when the whole cock destroyer movement happened, it made it almost, even though I was like, this word is so outrageous, isn't it? Like I'm a cock destroyer. Yeah, people are going, oh my God, you're a cock destroyer. Like, it's like, oh, you're, you're Rebecca Moore. You know, it's almost like my new name, but it was like, it was like this thumbs up to, oh, we're accepting you now. And it was because mm -hmm. of all of that. And I mm -hmm. thank everyone for that because it turned, it almost was a change in how people viewed me and how they viewed the whole, what I did and what I stood for. It was like, there was this change from that video and my daughter, I think, <laughs> because I all of a sudden had the community um, being wonderful and me doing all these other things, my my work was, I could kind of like, I was still doing porn films and still doing escort reading, but I was doing these club appearances, I was doing pride appearances and things like that. So it was kind of like, it all almost sort of gelled into one a little bit. And then we kind of started, we've had conversations and things like that. I do not talk about 
escorting with, I sometimes talk about it with my mum because it's something I'm really proud of, but you know, I'm very aware of people's boundaries and it might not, I, I don't know, you know, it's like, that isn't a boundary that, you know, if they're, if they want to talk about it, I'm happy to be open and talk about that, but I'll wait until that moment happens. So I'm very, I'm very socially aware and like about people's boundaries and stuff. So yeah. That, that makes sense. Um, yeah, you know, I, I've, I've spoken to a lot of other mothers and, and, you know, sex workers as well. And it's always like that question of when do you tell them? How do you tell them at what? Cause you're right. You know, when they're very young, it's obviously not an appropriate thing to say. Um, so like at what age do you tell them? And the problem is, is that these days with the internet, you know, kids are looking at porn way before they should be. So then you're almost forced to broach the subject before maybe you should, because, you know, they're not really of age yet, yet they're getting access to all of this stuff. So it's like this really tricky thing that, you know, I never had to experience because I didn't grow up with the internet. You know, when I was young, um, what my parents said to me was, you know, mommy and daddy make films and pictures for grownups. And that was kind of like the extent of it. And I was like, okay, it's for grownups. I'm not a grownup. So, you know, this is not something that I'm allowed to look at. And I didn't really, you know, I guess explore it kind of more. And then, you know, I kind of figured it out and I used to like steal their magazines and stuff, but it was just <laughs> magazines. You know what I mean? It was like different. And also too, my mom was, um, you know, she'd done some modeling, but she was ultimately a director and really just a photographer. So mm. it wasn't really of her so much. Um, but, but yeah, like I, I just, you know, when I think about, you know, my daughter and how I'm going to deal with that when she's older, because yeah, I mean, the internet is just like something it's kind of forces the conversation perhaps before anybody's ready to have that discussion. So it's just, it's such a hard topic and I'm just always, you know, curious about how, you know, different mothers deal with it. But I will say that I find that most of the time, you know, almost every mother is like, I'm doing the best I can, but it's still a struggle and I don't have like the perfect solution to that question. So. I also think that if you've got an excellent relationship with your child, which I feel that that I possibly didn't have with my son because of, you know, issues with his dad, I've always had a strong bond with my daughter. So if you have a strong bond with your daughter, your son, you know, as they grow up, it gets easier and you'll know the right time. That's what I feel in my heart is that like you are, I'm so, it, it's not about planning a conversation or anything like that. It's, it's, it just happens organically when there's love, like anything, anything's possible, you know, and I, I feel that my relationship with my son wasn't great from the get go in a, in a way because of the issues surrounding his, his father. So. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I agree with that. I was always very close to my parents. So, you know, I was lucky for that. And when I found out, I didn't, really care. And, you know, now that I'm older, I mean, I, and obviously I work in the same industry, obviously I don't care. Um, <laughs> but you know, I mean, it's, it's, you know, we have hilarious dinner conversations and, you know, sometimes I look at it from an outside perspective and I'm always like, God, this is, yeah, yeah, I guess we're kind of odd, but you know, I mean, we, we love each other. And in the end that, that that's really, I think all that matters. I, so. I think, I think love, love is like, if you've got this amazing relationship, everything's absolutely always going to be absolutely fine. That's what I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree. So, um, what, if anything, would you like to see change in the adult industry today? Oh, we can always have more wages. We can always get paid more. That's always that's always the go-to. Always more money. Um, what was I like to see change? I I personally feel that it's come a long way since I started. Anyway, I was um, I came to the industry sort of two thousand and eight or something like that. So a bit of a late start in the, in a way for for my age. I went straight in as milf. Um, 
Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just, I think we're all trying to be more inclusive and just have this just big pot of what, you know, no, no sections, just get on with it. Just everyone just get on with it and have a good time. And, um, yeah, I, 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 I've got, I don't have many criticisms because for my experience now is like, I, I do my own stuff. I mean, like, I've just thought, oh, do you know what? I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna shoot my own stuff. And so it's, mm. it's nice to, to be able to just have that experience of learning what learning the ropes, getting shit wages, and then go off and do it yourself. Um, yeah. So that that's been nice, and obviously the rise of OnlyFans has really changed things for people. It's changed people's lives in the sense that we're now making the money that people thought we were making in the first place. Um, because here in the UK, we you know. From what, you know, the grass is always green on the other side. Like we always look over at America like, oh my God, it's amazing over there. You know, like everyone's so glamorous. They've got mansions and there's us over here like, oh, we've got nothing. <laughs> you know, so it's just about, like people would always think, so um, people would always say, oh, I bet you live in a mansion and you've got a Ferrari. And we were like, in the early days before, pre only fans like we were like yeah we earn kind of good money but not what you're thinking but now it's great because you know only fans has changed people's lives financially and stuff like that but something i do know is always don't put your eggs in one basket always be prepared for the next shift so what i have seen is websites just go um you know, so always be prepared for the next movement, always change, always evolve. And you've just got to like, you can never get stale in this industry. You've always got to keep moving, whether it's technology, whether it's, I don't know, just trying new things out, whether it's a new social media platform, you can't just do what you used to do when you started, you know? Um, so yeah, to, to, what would I like to see change? I don't know. There's nothing like profound <laughs> that I mm -hmm. have to say. <laughs> well, it sounds to me like, um, you know, you, and I agree, there's been a lot of change since these personal content platforms have allowed performers to make, you know, their own money. And I think that that's kind of forcing a lot of changes in the industry that uh, we didn't necessarily think were going to happen. You know, I think brands, companies are respecting the performer a lot more than they used to. Um, I think performers feel empowered to have more say in their boundaries. So I, I definitely think that there's been some positive changes um, as a result of you know, you guys having more agency over your career, which I think is, is good for everybody. So, um, okay. So my last question, uh, so you've had a lot of exposure in the mainstream press. You've done interviews with vice paper magazine, uh, the BBC to name a few. Um, do you feel any kind of like responsibility in terms of changing the public's mind on how they view sex workers. Do you think that the overall misconception around the adult industry is, is changing with the new generation? Um, and if you could make the public understand maybe just one thing about our, our community, our industry, what would that be? I think the bottom line is that we are all human beings at the end of the day. Um, we are, if you don't like what we're doing, there's no need to be nasty. It's just we're human beings and we still have a life outside of what we do. And I don't think anyone ever really got that at sometimes. Um, and even like sometimes when I'd meet somebody, they'd like they'd sort of almost talk to you patronizing. It's like, I, I think you're normal, you know, like and it's like some people I do feel that um, they can talk to us in a in a way that we're not human in an inhuman way you can you can say whatever you want because we don't give a shit but it's like we're just this is just a it is it just a job to us you know um I, I do see a lot of it in there's almost like a younger 
like I'm 40 now. I've been on the shit side of social media, got through, like realized the stuff of it and like realized that it's a load of bollocks. But the younger generation, like I'm, I'm like, it's so long. I, I just love the younger, like the younger, the, like the younger only fans. Like I'm like, oh, wow, look at them all, you know, they're doing their own production and stuff like that. And I see, you know, girls and I just think it's just like jealousy. You know, these young women are making money. Yeah, you know, they're posting their how much they're earning. Probably not the most sensible thing to do um, online, you know, but they're just nouveau riche, getting very excited. But, um, you know, there's a lot of envy. It's like, let her just do what she, if If you don't like what she's doing or he's doing, so fucking what, you know? We're just humans and we all have feelings and... And and if you can't see that, then you know I think our skin's just going to get thicker, isn't it? Mm, yeah, I agree. Um, well, Rebecca, thank you so much for coming on. It's been such a pleasure to get to know you. Uh, can you tell everybody um, where they can find you online? Go ahead and plug all your links. Oh, thank you very much. Well, I'm on Twitter. Um, as more underscore milf I'm also on um, Instagram as more underscore milf I also have a little shop that you can buy Christmas presents from or whatever you want birthday presents that's called more filth um, we can see where this is going here um, I also have a YouTube channel which is very um, PG and it's more about my life and a bit more about me about the real side of my life and the real side of me so um which is called cool. it's called Rebecca Moore Milf <laughs> I've branded myself very well here and obviously my only fans which is my um uh, a very special place in my heart which I produce all my films such as Escorts The Dirty Weekend Away and some of my latex legends collection that you can come and look at and it's called more unschooled milk. And yes, I answer all my messages because I have nothing else better to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is actually um, something that a lot of performers <laughs> don't do is answer their own messages. They have somebody else do it. So if it is actually you answering your own messages, that is that is quite a feat. I, I have, honestly, what would I do with my time? I mean, I I have, like, I've done all the hard work. I can now mm. sit and answer my emails on, on OnlyFans. <laughs> no one can extract money out of a man better than me. Who else is going to do that? Oh, my DMs. <laughs> I'd like to know because why haven't they got their own profile? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. I love it. And you guys can follow me at Holly Randall on Instagram and on Twitter. Go to patreon.com slash Holly Randall Unfiltered to support this show. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next week. Since I've started working with Manscaped, they've really expanded on their product line. It's incredible. And if you get their perfect package, you will not only get ball toner and ball deodorant, but you will also get, of course, the electric trimmer, a shed travel bag, and their boxer briefs, which are the most comfortable boxer briefs. You can get all of this for 20% off at manscaped.com by using my code HRU.